And let's head off to sunny Australia and join Rob Carney. Rob, good evening to you. How are you? Good, thanks, Jerry. How are things? Yeah, good. Uh, life's a bit more normal, I think, for you guys than it is. I I'm not sure what the lockdown situation is like in Perth at the moment. Nah, no. Uh, life is very normal. We went into a five-day snap lockdown. They had one case, and uh, they, they cleared it after the five days. Uh, we couldn't couldn't leave home, and everyone was wearing masks. They thought it was the strangest strangest thing that has ever happened to them. Little did they know uh, everything that's going on back home. Um, you've picked the best time in the world to go off to Australia to play rugby. It turns out. Yeah, like it's I've I just been so blessed, and I, you feel a little bit sort of guilty by being over here and having such fun when you know all my family and friends are are going through what they are back home, but. You know, it, it really couldn't have worked out any better for me, to be honest. And so as a result, you're definitely not sharing anything on Instagram to make everybody feel like they're missing out on stuff. Well, I've been doing it a, a couple of times, and I must say I'm getting a bit of hate back from people, and there's been probably a fair few more unfollows than there has been to follow. Um, but, yeah, I'm a little bit mindful of, of not posting too much stuff. What's the rugby been like so far from, from that perspective? Um, you know, how, how are you playing versus how you thought you would be playing after a period of time away from the game? Yeah, uh, not too bad. Like, I played my first game uh, two weeks ago and got through, got through a full 80 minutes, which I was probably most concerned about. I hadn't played a game for seven months and then you know, I finished up at Leinster in September, and then I didn't didn't really have a team to do any tr uh, team training with or ball work for for four months un until I got over there in, in January, and then got thrown in pretty quickly. So I, I think just to get through the eighty minutes was was a big plus for me. Mic'd up as well. That's uh, a unique and new experience. Yeah, I'd actually done it a few times before. Uh, Sky Sports used to do it in in the league, but. I think the, the the difference this time was they waited four or five days to compile all the information and get the best bits where as Sky tried to do it during the game and it probably didn't work as well trying to, you know, censor all the, the language and all of that stuff and, and get it out, uh, you know, 20 minutes after they'd captured it. Did they give you an option to say, no, no, please don't put that bit out? Are you in any way asked, is that okay, is that not okay? No, I wasn't, and I was a little bit concerned because I said a few a few things that I wouldn't have been not happy about coming out. But even you know, people in trucks or or the cutters, as as they're known, um, there was a few things that, that I was a little bit concerned about. But uh, thankfully, everything that came out, I was happy enough with. Have you just managed to slot straight in as a vocal leader, Rob? Has that come easy to you, going down to, to that team and, I guess, slotting in as a new guy, but also the experienced head? Yeah, I think, you know, it has a little bit. And one of the things with this group is, is and I've told them this already, that maybe just they're a little bit quiet. There's a lot of young guys and, and lacking a little bit of leadership. And, you know, the coach, it was one thing that he said that, that he wanted me to bring um, when I was coming in. And I think... If, when you're coming into a new environment, if you can bring that early on within the first few weeks, it's it's easier to, you know, it's almost expected of you a little bit then. Um, so it, it was a role that I was happy enough to, to take up. It, it's an interesting conversation because we've been thinking about that in an Irish context over the last few weeks about when young players actually manage to take the step up and become leaders. When did you find that was the case for you that as a rugby player, you had the self-confidence to say, I can actually bark orders at my teammates here? Yeah, do you know what? It, it 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 always comes with you have to be backing it up on the field, and you know, as as a young guy, as soon as you start to put more and more good performances together, um, you you're limiting your errors is another big one because it's really hard to to bark and give out to every, all other fourteen players on the field if if you're slipping up and making some simple errors at times too. So, you know, it it, it definitely is for me. It was something when I was younger that the the more international games you start playing and, and the better performances you're putting together, the more of, uh, I suppose, a right you have then to try and lead. Is Does it, it help when you have coaches who are saying you're doing really well, continue to do this? Or is it all on you? Is it all on the player, Rob, to actually say, I'm, I'm confident now, I have the capabilities of actually being a leader and a vocal one at that? Yeah, I think to, there's, there's definitely an onus on... On the coach to to sort of to spur you on a little bit and say, listen, we need you to start stepping up up into this leadership role. You know, coaches are very good nowadays that they'll pinpoint 
maybe four or five younger guys who they see as potential leaders or future captains of the club and whatnot. And they sort of, you know, they give them a little bit more onus to, to share their opinion and to speak up in meetings and things like that. And, and that is something that an awful lot of coaches will do. Like I say, they'll pinpoint four or five younger guys and, and just slowly, you know, nurture them through the years. Rob, was it always your intention to have some time at the end of your career where you played away from Ireland? Or did you want to be a, a one-club player? What, what was behind the decision to move? Do you know what? I'd, I'd never thought too much about it. Um, you know, certainly back at the end of last season, July, August time, I, I was very much resigned to the fact that I was going to finish up in September. Um, there was no contract there for me at Leinster. And, and I'd very much come to terms with that because... You know, I've been so lucky with what I've achieved in rugby and, and how how many years I've been able to play uh, professionally at the one club. I think last last year and the year before were they were pretty unfulfilling for me in terms of you know not getting picked for obviously missing out in that Ireland squad and then losing my place at Leinster and you know not getting any sort of a sign off with empty stadiums and crowds. So. You know, it, it came around quite quickly and, you know, it's it's one of the best decisions I've made so far. I'm, I'm having the time of my life. Is it the type of thing that could extend that actually maybe you go on a bit of a world tour now and think, you know, why wouldn't I do something like this? You, you look at, say, uh, Dan Carter's officially retired just now, but he did play a long time at the end of his career, did travel a good bit, did see other rugby cultures. And I can see the I can see the attraction of that. Yeah, there, there, there definitely is a huge attraction. I think my eyes have, have definitely been opened up to, you know, the big bad world outside of Dublin that there is. And, you know, I've been so energized by joining a new club and meeting new people and coaches and, and everything that comes with that and, and trying to, to reestablish yourself a little bit. And also, you know, it was definitely challenging for me. I never thought I'd be playing super, super uh, rugby at, at 34 years of age. And, you know, it's 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 still early days. Uh, like I said, I played eighty minutes. I knew all about it for the Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday after the game. Um, so we'll see how the body goes over the next few months. Is coaching something that might not have been on your radar, and all of a sudden you go and you travel and you see other things and think, actually, you know what, I could do that. Yeah, um, you're you're bang on there. You know, when I was back in Ireland, it was it was something that I never thought that. I'd have been overly interested in. Um, I think when you come away to a new country and a new club, you know, it's, it's only just sort of dawned on me how much how much I've learned off some amazing coaches. You know, so Michael Checker, Joe Schmidt, and Stuart Lancaster, the three big coaches I've, I've had probably in my career. You know, I've learned a huge amount off them. And when you come into a new environment and you give your point of view and and I suppose your philosophy of, of how you see the game going, um, you can add an awful lot of value, and that's something that I didn't think I'd be able to do as much as I am. The difference between the game in the northern and the southern hemisphere is something that um, Ronald O'Gara would talk about quite a lot, particularly their intent, intention to attack, and and when people intend to attack versus well, let's just kick the ball and, and see how the territory is going to go here. What's that been like, and is, it, is that even different from Australia, from New Zealand as well? I, I mean, I know you've played one game, so it's very early, but the stuff that you're watching and, and what you're hearing in training. Yeah, I, I think the New Zealanders are, are definitely taking that to a different level, um, but it, it is all very much all-out attack, um, and the amount of, of ball and play is a little bit higher, and, and the speed of running, the, the amount of running that you do, you know, I, I think... I covered maybe eight and a half K in that game two weeks ago, which I wouldn't have covered in any game over the last few years. Um, so there's, there's definitely an awful lot more running in it. There's an awful lot more high speed running, um, which was, was probably the, the biggest area uh, of difference that I would have known from back home. And then the skills, obviously, uh, like, uh, is there a difference in, in the, the skill set? I'm not saying that they're more skilled or less skilled, but they just have different types of skills or is it essentially still the same game? It's just, played with a, a different intention yeah it's, it's still the same game there, there's definitely more you know you're, you're encouraged to take a lot more risks um if you throw the ball and it doesn't come off it's not really too much of a worry to the coaches they want you to to try all of that sort of stuff now you might not get away with it at international level but certainly in in the games that i've seen and been involved in um 
you know that they don't really they don't really care as much about mistakes and and you're you're encouraged to you know take those 60 40 chances whereas back home it would you'd be encouraged not to take a 50 50 now in saying that the dry ball and the conditions does make a huge a huge difference um you know when you're playing with wet balls and greasy balls it, it does make it an awful lot harder to, to to try and play that type of game when you were playing in ireland rob who was the coach that made you fear giving that 50 50 pass the most oh what a lot of question good man <laughs> um, <laughs> I think, listen, Joe was very much dead set in terms of how he wanted to play the game. Um, the less errors, the better. You hold on to the ball, you get good quick ruck speed and you put enough pressure on the opposition, you try and get tries from it. Um, and that's just a, a different philosophy that coaches have um, would, would be my answer on that one. Because, again, this is something that we've been speaking about as well over the last few weeks, this sort of... Not fear but this perceived maybe lack of ability to throw the offload which kind of stems from maybe the way players are thinking about the game that it's clearly not a technical issue with Irish players the players as they showed against Italy at the weekend are well able to do it what, what are the players thinking when those conversations are happening about Ireland not having an offloading game for example um well I, I can't tell you what the players are thinking in there at the moment I'm I'm you know, a couple of years out, out of the environment. But from my own perspective, what I will say is is that international rugby is tense. And, you know, it's it's pretty suffocating. And one error or one loose offload can go the other length of the field. And, and it's a big turning point. And, you know, I think it's very much the way Ireland have played over the last, last number of years is, you know, it is a little bit conservative, but you hold on to the ball, you wear the opposition down, and, and you build your points that way. Um, you know, I think Ireland played really well at the moment. We saw an awful lot more attacking from them and and in turn offloads. And, you know, hopefully that's something that they can bring into the next two weeks. Do we get a little bit too hung up on the idea of offloads? Do, do, do we look at that statistic and say Ireland aren't showing creativity in attack when actually maybe there is, but just in a different method or not including offloads? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's definitely one stat that... You know, if you lose, the, if Ireland lose the game, that people latch on to that stat and say, "Oh, well, that's why we've lost the game." Where you know there'll be so many times down through the years that Ireland would have won a lot of big games and and thrown very few offloads. I think it's when we get to games that we haven't won, like I say, and and that seems to be a stat that jumps out of people an awful lot of the time. And and definitely, I do think that it is it is something that we get a little bit hung up on. You know, the, the offload is is definitely something that is easier to do when you're a big man or woman winning the contact, winning the collision and getting your hands free. And I think Ireland are always going to be in that nation where, you know, we're not going to be able to bash the opposition just from sheer size. And, and that's going to be something that, that we're always going to have to deal with. The conservative philosophy you talked about there, is that something that the players are happy enough to do when it's winning. And so for a long time under Joe, we were winning games. There were there were tight games and there wasn't a whole heap of offloads. But because the style is successful and ultimately professional sports people get into sport and they need to win, um, it, that's just how that that evolved over a, a period of a, a number of years. And there was never really a question of, well, hang on a second now, in the long term, is this the right thing for us? Um, yeah, it's, you're, you're dead right. The bottom line is always winning. And, you know, you'll play whatever type of game that the coach is telling you to play or the type of game that you want to play if it's getting you the win at the other end. And, you know, and, and that's just the bottom line, not just in rugby, but in all sports, you, you do whatever it takes to have to win. Um, you know, now the, 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 the Scots and, and the English will, will definitely serve up different types of defences. They'll be stronger defensively. Um, you know, and, and like I say, hopefully Ireland can can bring a little bit of of that style of rugby they played into the weekend, into the next few weeks. Uh, I'm not sure how much Ireland you've watched over the, the last few weeks. What, what's your take on how that back three in particular is going? Yeah, I think th th they're going really well. Um, you know, it's, it's it's been a bit of a it's been a bit of a, a funny Six Nations. You, you look at Wales, and everyone is wondering how they've gotten there. Um, you know, Ireland obviously had that tough start when they played most of the game with 14 men. The French game was a little bit of a kick-a-ton due to the conditions. And then at the weekend, I think was the first time that 
that they finally started to express themselves as the team and, and played some some really good attacking rugby now, albeit against Italy, there will be bigger challenges over the next few weeks. Um, but the, the, the back three have gone pretty well there. Um, Hugo's probably been the standout performer. He looks really comfortable uh, and confident in that position. And, you know, so the, the, they've, they've been doing really good. What, what do you see in Hugo Keenan's performances that impress you the most? Well, you know, for, for me as a fullback, it's, it's always solidity, first and foremost. And, and you want to give all the guys in front of you um, that assurance and calmness that, that you're going to be able to to shovel up all the shite that when it comes up the other end. Um, you know, his, his sevens background is something that is is definitely standing to him. Um, he's unbelievably fit and, and he's, you know, he's quick. He's, he's got some good top speed and he demonstrated that at the weekend. Um, you know, and, and he's only going to grow more and more into that position the, the more he gets to play it. The bit where it seems like uh, when Ireland, certainly over the last kind of five or six months before, it became nailed on mm -hmm. that Hugo Keenan was going to be the fullback, where it was basically anybody who plays in the wing can also play fullback. Um, what did you make of that? Because it, it seems like it's quite a specialist position and maybe we underrated just how difficult it is to uh, switch between those positions. Yeah, I think it's it's something that that has definitely been not undervalued, but, but people just weren't so sure as to the differences between wing and fullback. They're very different positions. You, you can't take a winger, throw him in fullback and then hope that he just... You know, becomes a natural fullback after after a few games. There, there's definitely different levels of skill set that you need um, to be able to perform. You need to have a good understanding of reading the game, which is which is something that's really important. And you know, like I say, a lot of the time it comes back to limiting errors. And you know, sometimes people don't necessarily like that conservative approach. Um, but your fullback, more often than not, needs to be someone who who doesn't make too many errors. Ultimately, that's the bit, isn't it? That's the tension between you, you want to make sure that we don't get beaten in this game, give ourselves a chance to win it, and then the creative responsibility should be shared amongst the whole 15 players as opposed to, well, one of those two players or one of those three black pl players in the back three, let them have a little bit of magic because there's no, there's no system there. Over the period of time, the opposition are going to be able to close down your back three if, if that's where all of your attacking threat is going to come from. Yeah, definitely. And I'm, I'm sort of a big believer that that big games, when it gets to those crunch moments in the last, you know, five, six, seven minutes, games are generally won on a team making a big mistake as opposed to one individual producing an outrageous moment of magic. Um, now, I might be wrong in saying that, but, but that is definitely a philosophy that I've had over the last number of years. And, you know, the, the more guys you have in the team who will ensure that when those clutch moments come in the last five, six minutes, that they're not going to make big, big mistakes, you know, the more chance you will have of, of, of winning the game. Because I think a lot of people would just assume that how Leinster win their games is with that kind of offloading, free running. And but if, you know, if you look back at, say, the Champions Cup final in Bilbao, that was a clutch game that was won by a mistake from the opposition and, and Leinster not making that many mistakes and that was two of the best teams in world rugby at that point, Leinster against Racing and I guess if you look back at the All Blacks winning their World Cup, um, maybe uh, the one that ended their, their famine um, when they beat France in like it was a single point game at that stage and they didn't give away a penalty, maybe they should have, but they're the type of games that you're actually talking about as opposed to, oh we need to be uh, playing football like Brazil essentially. Exactly, and I think sometimes we get lost a little bit in in watching games throughout the season, league games that Leinster play, and you know some of these games are over after thirty minutes. It's not until you get to quarter quarter final levels of Europe um, and into your big international games when when all of these things become more important. Um, you know, there's so many games during the season that that what we're talking about isn't relevant because games are, are won after 40, 50, 60 minutes. So it's, it's definitely when you get to those higher stake games that what we're talking about now becomes more pertinent, I think. You got the Waratahs on Friday. How are you fixed for that? Yeah, good. Uh, travel to Sydney on Wednesday. The Waratahs just came off the back of their biggest ever defeat to the Brumbies. I think they were beaten 60 points to 10 or something. 
Um, now the Western Force had we had a difficult year last year, zero from eight, and lost our first game to the Brumbies last week. So we're very much desperately in in search of a win. And you know the the Warriors will be hurting now a little bit this week. They'll be questioning themselves in their own camp. So hopefully this is the week that we get the first W, as they call them down here. Well, listen. Best of luck with it. And thanks, William, for talking to us this morning, Rob. Cheers. Good stuff, lads. Thanks.